What is a church? Is it just a building? No. For our purposes, we're going to use a sociological definition that a church is an identifiable religious body of people holding to specific beliefs, practices, under the guidance of a common ecclesiastical structure. An ecclesiastical structure is the authority. Okay? So it's a community of people who share common beliefs and practices and have some sort of structure from an authoritative source. That's what a church is. And this theme of legitimate authority is an essential one in the sociology of religion. Okay, I, I don't know if you can see those, but those, are the, those were the, the basic essential churches. This is actually a little later but from, from this map, but those are the churches. There was a famous German sociologist by the name of Max Weber. Here's good old Max, famous, uh, famous sociologist, German sociologist, especially in, he really developed what we call the sociology of religion. Uh, and he framed the theme in the terms of what he called the need for transferred authority. The need for transferred authority. That is, while religious movements in general are founded by charismatic individuals, let's say in the case of Christianity, Jesus, whose personal power forms the original authority, when these individuals die, the followers are left with the question of how this authority is to be maintained. Once you, as long as you have the founder, well, that's who you turn to. What happens when the founder dies? And this isn't just a question for Christianity. It's a question for any religion or any movement, really. Okay? Any, any movement. Let's see. Or who speaks for the charismatic founder once he or she is no longer present? Major question. So, as mentioned previously, in terms of the first century, the initial transfers of authority went to the church at Jerusalem. Okay. Main players, Peter and James. James, the brother of Jesus, and, and Peter, uh, which sometimes considered his number one apostle. apostle. But with the destruction of the temple, a new source of authority was needed. You don't have Jesus, you don't have the church at Jerusalem. So a new source of authority was needed. And over time, this came to be referred to as the apostolic succession. The apostolic succession. There was James and Peter. The underlying idea of the apostolic succession was those closest to Jesus' original apostles knew the message best. And during the late first century, they refer, were referred to as the apostolic fathers. There were eight of them. They claimed not to have known Jesus, but to have known the apostles. And so these people, these eight, were turned to in terms of new authority. If, see, the question is, who knows what was really said? Well, the disciples die. There are the apostolic fathers, those people who knew. See, it's, you're passing it down. In, in Islam, this becomes called hadith. Somebody knew somebody who knew somebody. And then you see, can you trust, can you trust that core? You trust that source. Um, there were eight individuals, and three of the uh, best well-known, they're, they're shown down here, they're a little small. Um, were Clement of Rome, because he was at the Church of Rome, Ignatius of Antioch, he was at the Church at Antioch, and Polycarp of Smyrna. So these were the three really leading apostolic fathers. And their writings comprised the earliest Christian sources outside Scripture. 
So we have sources outside scripture. These guys were writing. Such individuals were associated with communities that came to be seen as the mystical bodies of Christ or the legitimate churches. Okay. All these various churches. There's no longer, there's no one church. There's a lot of churches. Right. The role of the churches was to establish ecclesiastical leadership. Okay. Leadership for the church. Now, notice I said churches. How did they do this? Through one, the nomination of bishops. Each church had a bishop. There was the bishop at Antioch, the bishop at Alexandria, the bishop at Corinth, the bishop at Rome. Okay. They all had. And then they would teach proper doctrine. So you're trying to establish how authority gets from Jesus to the churches. You do it through the apostolic fathers. They knew the disciples, so the message was passed down. And then you had your, your scriptures, which will come to, into play as well. So what's important is that the various churches comprised the church. There was no one church that dominated. All of the churches, it was sort of like a federation. All of the churches made up the church. Now, Rome always held a certain degree of prominence, but it was never considered in the early years the church. The church was a mystical body of the unified churches throughout the Mediterranean world, represented by the bishops. And the bishops would meet in council. That's how we get all these councils, to decide various questions. Uh, so the unity of the church was called the episcopate. Do you see the importance here that there's not, at this point, there's not, even though Rome had a prominence because that's where Peter and Paul were supposed to have gone, but all the churches comprised the church. There was no one church that dominated at this point. So the unity of the church was the episcopate or the power given to the body of bishops representing the various churches churches and they were valid because of the apostolic succession so the, the apostolic fathers appointed bishops and how does the system work now how do we get a new bishop bishops appoint bishops so that's the chain what you're trying to do is establish a legitimate chain of authority back to the origin so jesus the disciples the apostolic fathers the bishops and the, bishop, and the bishops continue. Bill? Yes. How long did that take? Well, the, we're talking about the first, mo most of this was taking part in the latter part of the uh, second century, 100 to 150 to 200. And we'll see that the same with the, with the canon was starting to be developed. But it's a good period of time. When you think that Jesus dies in 30, and you're really not being able to establish this legitimate authority for at least 100 years. A lot happens in 100 years. <laughs> and we're going to see as we go down the line, there were lots of different views of what should be legitimate. The, the bishops really had to, quote unquote, fight to establish this authority. There were all sorts of what later be called, where it became Christian heresies. And who determined what was a heresy? the church. <laughs> so, yeah, we're, we'll cover that in a moment. Yeah, but that it is. We're talking, you know, at least a century of things are very fluid. Very fluid. And can you, I mean, e imagine we don't ha have the technology of being able to communicate. How did you communicate? <laughs> by written letter, by boat. I mean, you can imagine. So what really, in, on the practical level, each one of these individual churches 
They tended to speak for the people around them. So the church, at, and one of the big ones was the church at Alexandria. Okay. That in, okay. So what we have now is something called the uh, Episcopate, and it is in the third century, the writings of one Cyprian, Saint Cyprian, who forms what is the first major doctrine of the church. Okay. Third century, the doctrine of the church. Because all of this is happening, you still have to sort of formulate it and put it down into some sort of text. What is the doctrine of the church? He was a bishop of Carthage in North Africa. I was recently in Carthage. It's in Tunisia today. Uh, and he died a martyr in the year 258. His most important work was on the unity of the Catholic Church. Now, remember, Catholic here just means universal. The word Catholic means universal. It's the Roman Catholic Church. He's not talking about Rome here. He's talking about the universal church, which is the mystical church of all the bishops together. Um, here he states, he can no longer have God for his father who has not the church for his mother. He who gathereth elsewhere than in the church scatters the church of Christ, nor is there any other home to believers but the one church. This is the notion that there's the one church and salvation is only possible inside the church. This is leadership trying to now control, or uh, there might be a bit of power, organize all these various texts, ideas, into some sort of coherent organization. And it's called the... He uses the analogy of Noah. He maintained the church was the indispensable ark of salvation. There is no salvation outside the church. That's where that idea starts. Now, what will happen over time is various individual churches will take that and say the same thing. There's no salvation outside our church. But it starts early on as an attempt to unify. He, he stressed the centrality of the See of Peter. That's the church at Rome but he implied no universal acceptance of Roman jurisdictional prerogatives. They're only one. They're a very powerful church, but they're only one member of the church. Do you see the problem, though, with the church? You don't have one location. It, that's why it's called the mystical church. It's a church that has... Uh, various geographical in, independent locations, but it, any one of those is not the church. So, so what's the United States? It's not each state. It's an idea. <laughs> it's an idea of the unifying of those states in some way. Now, you have doctrines, and you have texts, and you have laws, but that's what makes the United States. So that's something of what the early church was like. So, in summary, according to Cyprian, the unity of the church was the episcopate in which all bishops shared as if it were a common property. All the bishops. And apart from this unity, there is no salvation. You have to be part of this church. Because, as we will see, there were numerous heresies, as they later came to be. Okay, so that's the doc. Is there any any questions about that? How this the church sort of comes about? It starts with the destruction of Jerusalem. It goes. You have all these smaller churches. How do we how do we fit together in one one church? You have the uh, apostolic fathers, the passing down through the bishops, and you're building a structure. And then Cyprian comes along and sort of puts the seal on it. Says this is the structure outside of which you are no longer a Christian. Okay, so now let's turn to the can canonization of Scripture. And by canonization, which Scriptures are going to be acceptable and which are not? Okay. I think we mentioned last time, outside of 
just the gospel, four gospels, there were 20 other gospels that were floating around. Okay. So how do we decide which gospels are right? Okay. Um, so by the second century, there were two collections of authoritative documents assembled by the bishops. Okay. The bishops assemble these texts through the tradition of the apostolic fathers. The first collection contained the gospels with subheadings according to Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And I think I mentioned last time the, origi the original manuscripts have no names. There's no Matthew, there's no Mark, there's no Luke. These were named in the second century by one of these bishops who felt that he had accurate information through the apostolic chain. So I'm not saying that they weren't written by Matthew, Mark, and Luke, but if you picked up an original, you know how in the Bible today it says, uh, according to the, the, the gospel according to, that, that, that's not there. And the other interesting thing, and I think I mentioned this last time, if you ever noticed, you don't see the names of any of these guys in the Gospels. You don't see Matthew's name in Matthew. You don't see Luke's name in Luke. Okay. So in any case, um, there were, there were, there were the, the four Gospels. Then there was the second, known as the Paul, Pauline Corpus, or these are the letters of Paul, which we talked about last time. Uh, with the subheadings to the Ephesians, the Corinthians, the Romans. These are letters written to all these different ch churches, part of the church. And they were uh, then seen to be connected by the book of Acts. Because if you read Acts, Acts is much more historical. It's, it's describing what's going on in the early Christian community following the death of Jesus. So this, this is the original these are what we have to start with. Now, interestingly, I find it interesting anyway. This, uh, this gentleman, Ada von Harnack, who was a leading theologian in Germany in the 19th and 20th centuries, he argued that primitive Christianity was a religion of the spirit and not the letter. Original, the early communities. Oral tradition was much more significant. And he, he goes on to say the only reason the letter became significant, that means written text, is because there were so many heresies. And they did have written texts. So how do you combat that? You, cre you make sure you have your own written texts, your own canon. So his argument was the reason there was a need for a canon at all was there were so many other texts that were claiming so many wild things. I think I mentioned the Gospel of Peter last time, of uh, the cross coming out of the tomb and, and the claim that Jesus didn't suffer and all the Gnostic things that we'll talk about in a moment. So it's an interesting notion. He argued that early, the early communities just went by the oral. They were just inspired. They were almost like Pentecostals. They had the spirit, and text wasn't so important. Text becomes important, as according to Harnack, to counter these, these various uh, things. So in any case, uh, by the end of the second century, we have the first canon. It's called the Muratonian Canon. Uh, it's an ancient list of books drawn up in Greek and surviving in a single copy, as you can see. Up here, and we don't know who wrote it. We, I mean, we didn't wrote it. We don't know who put this list together. A canon is a list of all the scriptures that are considered legitimate. So the, in the second century, we have this canon. Um, it lists now. This it lists all the books of our current New Testament, except it doesn't have Hebrews in it. It doesn't have James and Second Peter. So the earliest list that we have. Does, didn't have those three books. But there were other canons. This wasn't the only one. Some of the leading bishops had their own. Irenaeus, who was the bishop of Gaul, Gaul would in France, would in France today. He didn't have Philemon, the letter, Paul's letter, 
He didn't have 2 Peter, he didn't have 3 John, and he didn't have Jude. Those were not in his canon. But included a book called The Shepherd of Hermas. Has anyone ever heard of this? You probably haven't heard of it because it was later excluded. But one of the early bishops, and a very powerful bishop, Irenaeus, included this in his canon. Uh, and it consists of five visions granted to one Hermas, who was a former slave. I suggest you get this for Christmas and read it. <laughs> Something interesting. Then there was Tertullian, another bishop, uh, Bishop of Carthage. He considered the book of Acts heretical. Luke's, the book of Acts, he didn't have it in the canon. So what does this show you? Even amongst the leading bishops, etc., there was question and confusion about which books were legitimate and which were not. It was not until Athanasius, who lived between 296 and 373 into the early 4th century, that for the first time, we find a list of New Testament books which exactly coincides with the New Testament today. In fact, the first reference is in a letter that he wrote in the year 367. So it's not until really the middle of the fourth century that there's a completely agreed upon canon. And the first council to accept that was Council of Hippo Regius in 393. Hippo, Regi, uh, I don't, Hippo is, is in North Africa. It, this is where St. Augustine was the, the bishop of Hippo. 393 is the first time a council accepts what we now have as the canon. And this was then... Uh, I, I, this is believed. I say believed because we don't have the, uh, the record of that council. But it was verified in 397 by a council at Carthage, which uh, St. Augustine chaired. And we know that Augustine, by that said, time, said the canon is closed. So you're really looking at close to the year 400 before there's an official canon. So there's a lot, of, a lot of things going on in that 300 years. So this significant question then arises is who is considered author of the canon? I mean, that'd be, okay. that's the canon. Well, who's the author or authors of the canon? The orthodox answer came to be that it was God in the person of the Holy Spirit, the third part of the Trinity. This is the, the, the word of God for the people of God. You hear that a lot? That's the notion. God is the author of the canon. Working through historical individuals. Now that working through might have some different discussion about what that actually means. But do you see why this becomes necessary? If you don't have an ultimate authority for your canon, then what's going to eventually happen knowing human beings? <laughs> You're going to, it's going to, yeah, it's going to fall apart, it's going to split. You're going to have one bishop saying one thing, one, yeah. So this was the way of establishing ultimate authority. Uh, but how is one to know that the established Canon was God's canon. And this is where the two come together. Here the canon is connected with the doctrine of the church. Who determines the canon? The church. This is what we were talking about earlier. So we had the doctrine of the church. We have the canon and the two come together. Meaning that the church is the legitimate uh, interpreter of scripture. A position which would become problematic during the Reformation. 
the reason I raise this is the, the, much of the Protestant Reformation was only the Bibles. Just go to the Bible. The church, because who was Luther against? He was against the Catholic authorities at the time. He believed that the Bible spoke to each individual. Sola Scriptura. Only if it's in the Scripture. The church said, wait a second. Who's going to decide what is in the Scripture? You have to have some sort of authority. In which they said to Luther, even the devil can quote Scripture. But much of the Protestant Reformation, and that is based on Go to your Bible and look, right? It's in the Bible. The Catholic Church would say the Bible's only one part. There's the church. And you can't separate the two. So this becomes a major issue for the, uh, during the Reformation. But at this time, the two are brought together. So the creation of the Orthodox doctrine was a result of two factors. First, the diverse images of Jesus, and the need for proper belief. The church believed, except you had to have the proper belief about Jesus, about Christianity. You had to have the right ideas. And as a result, there were uh, lots of earlier groups that were called heresies. And they always revol revolved around two essential questions. Jesus' nature and his relationship to God. These were the questions where ideas were flowing in all sorts of different directions. There were 20 to 30 major heresies which got weeded out. I just want to mention two to give you an example. One was known as the Ebionite movement or Jewish Christianity as it was later called. And the church fathers deemed them heretical. Ebionite is derived from the word ebionim, meaning the poor or the poor ones, which suggests that they placed a special value on voluntary poverty. The movement arose about the time of the destruction of the temple, 70 CE. Some scholars argue that the Ebionites constituted the mainstream of the Jerusalem church, which was very heavily Jewish in its approach. Do you remember, Paul had to argue with these people about teaching the Gentiles. They tended to fall back on Jewish law, circumcision, for example, which had to be followed. Now, Paul eventually was able to get his right to teach the Gentiles. But the Ebionites probably, after the destruction of Jerusalem, went underground, and it's felt that they, they actually left uh, and, and became part of the diaspora. Now, what's important is they regarded Jesus as a mortal human messianic prophet. They followed the traditional notion of Jewish messiah. The Messiah would not be God. The Messiah would be a prophet, most likely one who was involved in overthrowing the powers of the world. So there you can see a clash already. Yep. Um, they, also, they also believed that Jesus or was not, as a result, not divine. And... Uh, they had something called the Gospel of the Hebrews. Their Gospel was Matthew. You remember last time I mentioned that Matthew was, is often considered the most Judaic of the Gospels? He compares Jesus to Moses. The law becomes important, etc. They believed that the, uh, the Gospel of Matthew was really the only legitimate text. Now, these, this is the Ebionites now, and they're going to be considered heretics. They considered Paul an apostate. Do you know what an apostate is? 
An apostate is someone who turns away from belief. If you were a Muslim, for example, and you decided to be a Christian, you would be an apostate of Islam. They considered Paul, the Ebionites, an apostate. An apostate from Judaism. He was doing something with this new message that was not right. Of course, the Ebionites have disappeared from history. It's interesting. Um, there, it's believed that they, they went beyond the Jordan River. They left Jerusalem when the temple was destroyed. And one of the interesting things is that this might be the group that Muhammad had contact with. Because Islamic view of Jesus is very much similar to the Ebionite view of Jesus. And we know that Muhammad has a, traveled up and down the Hejaz as part of a, a caravan. He was part of caravans as a young man. So in any case, um, so that's, that's one. The second in, was, were the Gnostics. The Gnostics. The Gnostic heresies. The word Gnostic comes from the Greek word gnosis, K-N-O-S-I-S, which means knowledge. Gnosis means knowledge. Not factual knowledge, like 2 plus 2 equals 4. That's not gnosis. It's an intuitive, spiritual knowledge, something you know intuitively and spiritually. Well, we, we're, we get the word agnostic. What does agnostic mean? One who doesn't know. What does gnostic mean? One who knows. So they claim to know, not 2 plus 2 equals 4, but essential spiritual knowledge about reality. Uh, and they believe this could be ascertained through secret teachings that were available through highly advanced souls. Highly evolved spiritual people who understood intuitively the nature of reality. Um, there were a lot of variations. Uh, some of the common ideas included that material creation was flawed and was in fact the product not of a high God, but of a lower God. Now, when we think of God, we think of a God of creation, right? The Gnostics said, uh-uh. Creation came about from a lower being. And they, well, why do you say that? And what would a Gnostic say to you? Look at the world. Look at the, world. Look at the suffering. Look at the pain. How do you tie that in with this wonderful creator God? So they believed that the creator God was really a lesser being. There was a God. Uh, but he had nothing to do with creation. What he had to do with is saving you. He could get you out of here. <laughs> but you had to have that gnosis to do that. Now, do you see how this might fit into Christianity? Who's the savior? Jesus. Jesus is in touch with this higher reality, and he has come to save people from creation to get them out. Do you remember, in, uh, this it's got some of me, but over 20 years ago now, the group down in San Diego who committed ritual suicide with, tied in with the comet? Yeah, uh, they were Gnostics. They, uh, what was interesting, if you ever watched, they all recorded beforehand their, their last testimonies. And they all were saying, we're not the crazy ones. You guys are. <laughs> you want to stay around here? <laughs> so th it was this sense that the Gnostic element was that creation itself is not good. You have a spiritual spark within you, or some of you. <laughs> this is sort of an elitist thing. A spiritual spark within you, which was tied in with the ultimate God, and you're... The role of the savior figure was to take you there. But like this came through secret teachings, and it was pure spirit. And the knowledge of this truth was the key to salvation. If you knew this truth, 
there was general opposition to the idea of the resurrection of the body. Can you see why? <laughs> the body? Why would you want to keep that thing? All it does is decay. And so we get, and this was another individual heresy, but it's tied in, and I think Reverend Kim mentioned it last week. It's called docetism, or docetism, you can see. What do you notice there? The figure of Jesus. There's no body. Jesus doesn't have a body. Jesus is pure spirit. If he has a body, it's only temporary. It's not real. It isn't what we call, it has no substance. So this was going to be, obviously, a heresy. Let me give you an, an example of one of these. And it became quite popular due to National Geographic published one of its texts a few years ago. The group was called the Sethians, S-E-T-H-I-A-N-S. -E and the text was found in 1945 at a place in Upper Egypt called Nag Hammadi. And it was called the Gospel of Judas. Now, what's the orthodox traditional view of Judas? He betrays, right? He's, he, he's a betrayer. And in fact, uh, it became a really anti-Semitic trope during European history. He was the ultimate example of what it was to betray. But this gospel is very different. The text introduction announces this is a secret account of what Jesus revealed to Judas. Jesus is then pictured as indicating to his disciples they don't really know him, or more significantly, the God who sent him. He then speaks to Judas privately. He says, step away from the others, and I will tell you the mysteries of the kingdom. And Judas speaks to Jesus about his own vision. He sees himself being stoned by the disciples. And Jesus responds telling Judas about his betrayal, which will cause him to be cursed, but adds, but you will exceed all of them, for you will sacrifice the man that clothes me. You will sacrifice the body, but you won't sacrifice my spirit. Jesus then teaches Judas the secrets, quote unquote, no person has ever seen, which include that Jesus comes from an immortal realm called Bardello. This, this sounds a little like science fiction, doesn't it? But this, is, this was one of the heretical texts. And salvation comes not by worshiping the God who created this world, but denying the world and the body that binds it. This, now, the, what the Gnostics may have done in terms of the Orthodox tradition, if, if you know anything about Christian history, there's a very strong ascetic element. Many of the saints you know, sitting on poles, going into caves, uh, giving up all their worldly possessions, etc. The Gnostics taught this. The way to salvation is to give up the world, not to claim it. OK, so um, this is what, uh, it, at the end, Jesus shows his disciples a vision and then tells them. This is according to the Gospel of Judas. You have been receiving the offerings at the altar. That is who you are. Yeah, the altar. That is the God you serve. And you are those 12 men you have seen. They've had a dream of 12 men. The cattle you have seen brought for a sacrifice are the many people you have led astray before the altar. So who's the only disciple who's speaking the truth? Judas. All the others have betrayed Jesus. Now you talk about a <laughs> turnaround in terms of trying to understand. But if, if anything, this gives you a notion of the variety of ideas that were floating around 
about who this person was. Uh, and at the end he says, God has received your sacrifice from the hands of a priest, that is, a minister of error. So they're, they're speaking against this church that is being developed, and all its priests, they're all wrong. But it is the Lord, the Lord of the universe, who commands, on the last day they shall be put to shame. Stop sacrificing over the altar. A baker cannot feed all of creation. So an interesting, uh, so. Um, if you're interested in this, these things, there's a, a, a book called Lost Christianities by Bart Ehrman from North Carolina, a wonderful scholar. He lists the, the variety of heresies that, there, that, that, that existed. So the reason I spent so much time on heresies is because this is what the church was now trying to bring to some sort of consolidation. What ideas can be accepted and what can't? We probably can't accept docetism. We can't teach, we can't take the gospel to the world and tell every people, tell everyone, the only thing you can do is get rid of your body, you know, just be, live an ascetic life, uh, no sex, uh, that, that's the major sin because all that's doing is, is bringing in more suffering into the world. So that's probably not going to spread very far. So they have to get rid of the, and why not the Ebionites? Well, because they didn't believe Jesus, their belief about Jesus wasn't in line with doctrine as it had developed. Okay, so let's, uh, uh, a few minutes, let's get to, to, uh, to, to orthodox, orthodox belief. The first, the first real orthodox uh, statement of, 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 of doctrine is the Apostles' Creed, um, widely used for both liturgical and educational purposes. Uh, the origin of the creed, although it's probably slightly different from this, probably the late second century. And uh, I had to memorize this, I remember as an Episcopal altar boy. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, meaning universal, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. That's the earliest doctrinal creed, second century. But in terms of the evolution of that creed, now we turn to one of the great historical events, and that is the conversion of a Roman emperor by the name of Constantine. So who was Constantine? He was the son of Flavius Valerius Constantius, who had become the deputy emperor in the western part of the Roman Empire in 293 CE. By this time, the Roman Empire had kind of split. There was the Western Empire, and there was the Eastern Empire. The Western Empire centered at Rome. Eastern Empire centered at Constantinople, what today is Istanbul. And in 305 CE, he was raised to the rank of Augustus, senior Western emperor. His mother, and this is interesting, who was his father's consort, not his father's wife, was a Christian. Helena, and she's a very interesting character in the tradition of Christianity because she will go to Jerusalem and she will do lots of things in terms of finding the original cross, or at least it was claimed, and that's why if you go to many uh, cathedrals in Europe, you'll find splinters of that cross or what claim to be splinters of that cross, as well as other relics. But anyway, um, so he eventually becomes emperor of the Roman Empire, and he was preparing for battle. He was preparing for battle at a place called Milvian Bridge. And he has a vision. He has a vision. 
He saw with his own eyes in the heavens a cross arising from the light of the sun, carrying the message, with this sign you will conquer. He wins the battle. He entered Rome, which was when you went about, you entered Rome with your legions, but he ignored the altars to the pagan gods and did not carry out the customary sacrifices to celebrate a general's victory. Instead, he had his rival decapitated and paraded his head through the streets. Shortly thereafter, he converted to Christianity. Although he was not baptized until shortly before his death. In, thir in 313, he issued the Edict of Milan, legalizing Christian worship. Do you see what a turnaround this is? For, until this time, Christianity was essentially a persecuted religion. The story of all the martyrs. The, the emperor becomes a Christian, legalizes the religion. What does that do for the growth of your religion? The emperor has become a, a Christian. Well, so Christianity had suddenly changed from a persecuted religion to the official state religion. And the consequences would, as one can imagine, be immense. When you have the power of the state behind you, things change. He became a patron of the church, supported the efforts for the establishment of a unified doctrine. Now, this is what is important. Why does he need a unified doctrine? Not only just for Christianity itself, but for the state. Okay. We need a unified doctrine of the official state religion so we can unify the empire. Otherwise, you're going to have all these other... Uh, uh, and there was a major issue at the time. So he called a council in 325 at Nicaea. Oh, this was, his, this was his shield. Very interesting. It's called the Chi Rho. It's the two letters, Chi and Rho, of the first two letters of Christos in Greek. So the Chi, the, like Sigma Chi, <laughs> the Chi, and he wore that, he put, that was on his shield. And he always went into battle with his, with, with the Cairo on the, yeah. Um, so uh, the controversy is known historically as the Arian controversy, A-R-I-A-N. It was named after Arius, A-R-I-U-S, who was a presbyter, not quite a priest, from Alexandria, major church. Still a major church. On one side of the argument were those who sided with what was called Trinitarianism. On the other side, the supporters of Arius believed in Unitarianism. This was the major conflict. So the doctrine of the Trinity. I'll try and take this slowly because it gets a little complex. And if you don't grasp it, that's fine defined defined one god in three divine persons father son holy spirit you, yeah, so far so good the three persons were distinct separate yet one in substance or nature and i look people seem confused okay it Okay, a nature is what one is, while a person is the form of what one is. Still confusion. Okay. Perhaps an analogy would help. Water is the essence or nature. Ice, liquid, steam are its possible forms. Three forms from one nature. Does that make a little more sense? There's water, 
it can be expressed in three different forms. That's essentially what the tr doctrine of the Trinity is trying to do. It's also considered a mystery, transcending complete rational understanding. As each person, the three persons, was also understood to be God whole and entire. How can three become one? Well, somewhat of a mystery for rational thought. The whole work of creation and grace was one single operation common to all three persons who at the same time operated according to their own unique qualities. Get, if you, the water, I mean, if, you, if that helps, go back to that. Since all three were consubstantial in essence, they were also co-eternal in time. I'm sure this is all very clear. If not, it's a mystery. But this has become the cornerstone of orthodox doctrine. Because at the Council of Nicaea, Arius was defeated. What did Arius hold? He taught absolute monotheism. The son could not be an emanation of the father and could not be without a beginning, as this would make him the brother of God and not the son of God. <laughs> That's an interesting way of putting it. Thus, God is eternally the father, and before creation, the son did not exist. See, according to the Trinity, the son exists co-eternal with the father before creation. That strikes at monotheism according to Arius. In any case, the Nicene Creed, and this, how is this decided? Votes of the bishops. They decided that the Trinitarian position would be orthodox. And from this point on, it has been uh, the Roman Catholic, the Eastern Orthodox, later Anglican, and the majority of Protestant <coughs> denominations hold to the uh, Nicene Creed. And your homework tonight is to go find it and read it and memorize it. <laughs> That's what I had to do when I was... Uh... Okay, we're almost done. A hundred years later, now we're in the fifth century, 451, at the Council of Chalcedon, affirmed that Christ had two natures, fully God and fully man, distinct, yet always in perfect union. Another mystery. All God, all man. That contradicts logic, doesn't it? It can't, it can't be all A and all B. This says, yes. In the council decided he was all God and all man. Why did he have to be all man? From this, can you think of a reason you might have to be, why this would be posited? Yes, yeah, so he knew what human suffering was. A God, see the, the, the docetists, they didn't believe that Jesus suffered. He didn't have a body to suffer. He was there to, as, as a spiritual light. So this says, yes, Christ was all... When he suffered on the cross, he suffered. Whereas in Islam, they, they also say he didn't suffer on the cross. Why? A, a God can't suffer. Anyway, um, this created the first real break, however, because, and I'm sure most of you know this, the Coptic, Ethiopian, and Syrian Orthodox churches broke away at this point. Now, these are the Far Eastern churches. Not, I'm not talking about the Greek Orthodox or the Russian Orthodox. There are the Coptics. They were in Egypt, the Ethiopian, the Syria. And these churches still exist, by the way. They're not, they're not big, but they exist. They held that Christ had only one nature, divine. Whereas Chalcedon and Orthodox Western Christianity said two. All man, all divine. 
So following Nicaea and Chalcedon, the churches at Rome and Constantinople became increasingly dominant. And we'll finish by just telling you that in the 11th century, they had each claimed their superior station as the church and mutually ex excommunicated each other. The Roman church excommunicated the, the Eastern Orthodox Church, and the Eastern Orthodox Church, in return, excommunicated the Roman Orthodox Church. So uh, that's where we're going to end. The story gets, gets interesting after that, with the, especially as you lead up to the Reformation. But do you see these es the essential questions that have to be answered by any religion? How do you know what you believe is true? What authority do you rely on? What are the texts that you accept? And then what is the structure, ecclesiastical structure, that will assert that? And of course with the Reformation, the whole thing splinters. And Interestingly, and I'm not, I'm not a Catholic, but interestingly, the Catholic Church warned Luther, do you know what you're doing? Do you see the implications of breaking up this church? And it wasn't long thereafter that the Protestant movement itself went and has continued to do so. And I think, what did Reverend Elbert say? How many Christian denominations are there? Thousands, I forget, thousands, thousands. Everything from the Roman Catholic Church and the church in Constantine to, have you ever driven by some of these little um, churches in malls? You know, the, the mall churches with, the, yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, questions, insights? Uh, we do want to mention the, the series is going to continue next week. Reverend Albert's going to give, I think, three weeks on the book of Revelation. And the book of Revelation was the last book to be accepted into the canon, and it was at the, uh, the Synod at Hippo, Hippo Regius. So, so he's going to give three weeks on that, and, uh, and then we'll, we'll move on after that. So questions, yeah. Yeah, so, so you mentioned earlier that if anyone feels they have to go, by the way, please, I, I will not be insulted. Go ahead. So the Catholic Bible has some other, another section. Yeah, the Catholic Vulgate. It's not in the Protestant Bible. What, what is, what is there, it's called the Apocrypha, and there, it's not, I don't have all the, well, maybe, it's Old Testament books. Let's see if I have them. Yeah, the Protestant Bible has 66 books, 39 in the Old Testament, 27 in the New Testament. The Catholic Bible has 73 27 in the New Testament, but 46 from the Old Testament. So they have additional Old Testament books. So you know why they were dropped? Why they were uh, dropped by the, the, by the Protestant? It was probably, you know, I don't know the details, but it was probably part of the, the Reformation. Except saying, but, well, we know that even Luther, the, what he said about the book of James, he said James was a book of straw. Because what is James... If you know James at all, what does he focus on? Good works. <laughs> Luther said, no. Works can't save you. Only faith. And so he thought James was overdoing works. Luther had some strong opinions. <laughs> yeah, any other? Yeah, Chris. Um, knowing that they are councils of people that are making Mm -hmm. Doesn't it make some people feel that how did they come to be the authority to say what people need to believe? And can you see why Luther may have said, sure. look, why tell me what the that um, of the Trinity when I don't really see it that way? Or why well, the you're that you have to believe? Well, the early, the early position was it was the Holy Spirit working through the church. That's why it was so important at the beginning for the church to establish authority. And of course, even though it established authority down the line, 
it began to be challenged by people like Luther because they saw the church doing things that just didn't seem to mesh up with their understanding of Jesus' teachings, especially when it came to indulgences. Although indulgences does get a little bit of a bad rap. It's not, it wasn't quite as harsh as it, it's, all it was saying was if you, <laughs> if you give money to the church, it will help create St. Peter's. And in addition, it will also help get, uh, allow you to pray to help people get out of um, purgatory. purgatory. Yeah. And what do churches do today? Yeah. <laughs> we raise money. Yeah, you raise money. We probably don't tie it in with getting people out of purgatory, <laughs> but... Uh, you know, it was it was it was a good it was a good sales pitch, I guess. Be if you, you mean if if you if anyway. So yeah. Well, well people were were not educated. Yeah. I mean, we're often were illiterate. Yeah. They, they didn't it, really know. I mean, they were relying on these right. church leaders to tell them. Right. And one thing you know, ger what one thing Luther did is he translated the Bible into German. Right. So he, uh, but this was part of his sola scriptura. You can, if it's only in Latin, you're not going to be able to read it and decide. So we'll translate it and give it to you. But wait a second. <laughs> Who, who's going to determine what that means? It's a constant problem in every religion. Who determines what is doctrine? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, actually, the plan is, as I understand it, I'm, I'm probably not going to teach again to February. Uh, Reverend Kim has a couple. He, he's going to do something on the book of Revelations. And then because he has to, normally we switch back and forth. He's got, a, he's got a lot of outside responsibilities later. So I think he's going to do a series on the Christian denominations to explain the difference. Then when I come back, I was thinking of moving into the Reformation in history. But I think maybe you guys are getting a little tired of history for the moment. So we're going to move a little bit more to the practical. We're going to deal with controversial issues, Abo like abortion in, yeah, in Christianity or in society at large. Abortion, capital punishment, and they, questions which churches have say say it uh, right to death I mean suicide right to end your life uh, uh, gay and sex, sexual questions uh, just war I think there can be five of them and the idea is not to get up here and tell you what's right or wrong what I'll do is I'll give you a history uh, let's say a history of abortion so you know a little bit about what views have been in the past give you the pros and the cons and then you go home. I mean, we really don't want it to be people getting up here trying to say, this is, this is what you have to believe or you don't believe. Let's do it objectively, like you do in a law school, right? You know, in law school, and I was trained this way as a Socratic teacher, one of the best things you can do is find, an argue, find something you totally disagree with and try and make the best argument for it. You don't have to believe it, but try and make... Otherwise, it's called, um, you know, just getting rid of, you know, you heard the term a straw man. You set something up and you knock it down easily. That's when you take a position and look only for its weak arguments. Try and find its strongest arguments. So that's what we're going to do. We're not going to get up. With, I think the history part is important so that you understand everything has a historical context. For example, the whole abortion issue really focuses on the, not so much the actual abortion part, but when does life begin? And that's varied. In fact, really until the 19th century, the common view was called the quickening. That's the movement, when you first feel the movement. In the 19th century, and I'll be talking, the idea at conception became more dominant. It had a lot to do with the American Medical Association, by the way. Um, so these are the real issues. So it, it, to just know a little bit of the history and then 
Okay, here are the pro arguments, here are the con arguments. I'm not asking people to get up and support one or the other. I'm not gonna support one or the other. I have my own views. But to at least understand compassionately what the other side thinks. Yeah. That's what I think we've lost today. Any sort of sense that the other side can have anything right to say. And I'm not, either way. And when you get, when you get to that position, your society's in trouble. You don't talk to each other. Imagine if you have a family and you get together for Thanksgiving and nobody talks to each other. <laughs> or they just scream. Or they scream. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I've said enough. Thanks so much for coming out on these cold evenings. <laughs> <laughs>